everybody. I guess it was my cue because Jeremy's not here. Welcome. It's Palm Sunday today. So let's all praise the Lord. Set if you like. It's up to you. Thank you. 
and think about it this week about how deep the Father's love is. So if you go to your holy week. Welcome on this Palm Sunday morning. My name is Nat Erickson, I'm the pastor here. Welcome to the new faces, welcome to old faces. Maybe you're new because I haven't seen you before. I've only been here for 12 weeks. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty new myself, but welcome. And good to see some people back from various trips. And today kicks off what we call Holy Week, the week where we remember that Jesus came, not only was he born, but he came to die, and he died that he might live again. And as we celebrate over this coming week who Jesus was and is, we'll just take time as, as a fellowship now to greet one another in this, this festive memory day that we call Palm Sunday. So we take a moment now to greet one another.
Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Our offertory prayer. Lord God, from you and through you and to you are all things. Give us wisdom to steward the little which you have given us so that we might not misuse it. Give us hearts to care for hurts in the world so that what you have given to us might be a blessing to others. May our stewardship and giving guide our hearts and the hearts of others to worship you so that all the things you have given to us may return to you with glory. Amen. Our second scripture reading is Matthew 21, 12 through 17, and can be found on page 1,532 in your pew Bibles. <clears throat> Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, <clears throat> they were indignant. Do you hear what those children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? And he left them and went out of the city of Bethany where he spent the night. The backdrop of what's going on here is Passover. Jesus had been going around teaching and ministering for somewhere around three years now. And during that time, he had, for several different feasts, come back and forth to Jerusalem and then would go back up north to Galilee, where he did most of his ministry. Through his ministry, his work, and the ongoing work of his followers, everything had reached a fever pitch as he approaches Jerusalem this time. It's no accident or political miscalculation that brings Jesus here to Jerusalem. He didn't misjudge the mood of the people and wanted to start a revolt, and they weren't quite ready. Um, and he also wasn't presenting himself quite like the ascendant king of the nation. We're going to see that Jesus is operating on a different playbook from what people around him wanted him to be on as he comes to Jerusalem in preparation for this Passover. While many of his contemporaries had desires for a political, national, religious revival of the nation and a, and a takeover and a driving out the Romans, Jesus is thinking of other things. So Passover was one of the three pilgrimage feasts in which Every Jewish man who was an adult was supposed to travel to Jerusalem for the feast. Um, 
it was a, a feast of great importance. So people would travel not just from the area around Jerusalem, Judea, but also from the Galilee north of that, and really from the, uh, the whole Mediterranean world. Jews would travel back to Jerusalem. Conservative estimates say the population of Jerusalem at this time was about 30,000 people, and during Passover it was probably closer to 200,000 people for a week. So most cities don't have the capacity to suddenly increase their population by six times over for just one week. So people would be all over the place, camping around on the hillsides all around Jerusalem. Is a swarming mass of humanity around the city of Jerusalem. And as Jesus approached Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday nearly 2,000 years ago, he would have been walking through a huge crowd. So we're told that Jesus rode in on a donkey. He got his disciples to acquire this donkey. Now Jesus, in his whole ministry throughout the Gospels, never once is it mentioned him riding an animal. He walked all over the place. Only rich people had animals to ride. Jesus walked all over the place. So the fact that one or two miles outside of Jerusalem, he decides, oh, I need to ride in now, it's not because he can't walk. He's making a point. So what is this point? What is this point? On top of that he didn't need to walk, it was expected that people coming to Passover walked. Right? You weren't supposed to ride in. So Jesus makes a very calculated approach to Jerusalem. And think about this for a minute. Thousands of people all walking, sitting, camping, standing around the city. What's the effect of sitting up on a donkey? Everyone can see you. Jesus rides on this donkey for a purpose. Everyone can see him. That's exactly the point. And Matthew helps us understand this by pointing to a, a prophecy, one of Israel's ancient prophecies from the prophet, I not Isaiah, Zechariah. In Zechariah 9.19, Matthew tells us, this occurred, Jesus wrote in, to fulfill the words spoken through the prophet, say to daughter Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and sitting on a donkey, on the colt, the young of a donkey. Did you catch that? Your king is coming to you, Matthew tells us. To anyone steeped in Israel's scripture, it would be hard to miss the point that Jesus is making by choosing to sit on a donkey and ride up to Jerusalem this Passover. So if you want people to assume you're really important today, right, you show up in a limousine. Okay, Jesus shows up on a donkey. It's a little different, but he's showing his importance. He's embodying this prophecy from Zechariah that people are looking forward to the king who's going to come to Jerusalem. And here he says, here I come. There's a subtlety in the message which Jesus sends and what he's doing. And it's a subtlety that the jubilant crowd seems to not appreciate that much. But he's riding a donkey, just like Zechariah said. And why that's significant is that the donkey is a symbol of a peaceful king. Kings who were pointing out that their powerful warriors rode horses, because that's what you rode into battle. In times of peace, royalty would ride a donkey. So Jesus coming in riding on a donkey is saying, I'm coming as a peaceful king. It'd be kind of like the difference in modern terms of the, uh, the political leader showing up in a limousine or a Humvee. Right? They clearly have different purposes showing up on the donkey. Well, the jubilant crowd may not have been in the mood for fine parsing what animal Jesus is riding. It's important for understanding how he presents himself. Okay, and that's one of the central questions the Gospels again and again make us ask. Who is Jesus? And the way he comes in on a donkey is part of that answer. Because at the same time, he's putting himself forward as a king, and he's also saying, my brand of king is different than what you want. 
know what you're expecting. Not necessarily the king that you're hoping for right now. So the, the response to the crowd, though, indicates they got the point. Here's the king. Okay? At least they understood that big point. He's making a claim that he is going to be like King David, the king from a thousand years before the time of Jesus, who was the symbol of the golden era of Israel and who was the embodiment of their hopes for future political and religious ascendancy and power. And they receive him with a royal welcome and with enthusiasm. But as we think about, before we think about what they're actually saying, I just want to point something out in the text here from, from verse 9, where we read, now the crowd was going ahead of him and was following, shouting out. Okay. So notice who it is that's shouting out with joy about Jesus showing up. It's the crowd he was going to Jerusalem with. Okay, the travelers he's already with. And, and indeed, in verse 10, we're told that the city of Jerusalem was shaken by the occurrence, which echoes similar language from chapter 2 when wise men show up to Jerusalem and asking, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And we're told that King Herod was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Here again, we see Jerusalem receiving Jesus as a threat rather than as a deliverer, rather than as a king to be received with joy and with worship. So not, on a purely historical note, it is significant to note that it, it's primarily the crowd traveling with Jesus who's excited rather than the city, the people in the city. And that helps us to make better sense of how the next week of Jesus' life unfolds. Okay, because the crowd on Good Friday calling, crucify him, crucify him, is primarily not the same group of people who are outside the city saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Right? It's the city that was already arrayed against him. There's two major groups here. The one says, Jesus, come, Hosanna, and the other says, Jesus, go, we don't want you. And Christians and people act, acting under the name of Jesus throughout history have too often justified doing a lot of terrible things to Jewish people just by saying they killed Jesus. Okay, but what we see when we pay attention in our Gospels undermines that. Okay, some people said, Jesus, go away. And other people said, Jesus, we want you to come. Right? There's, there's different groups here on the scene. And also, just note, we call this event the triumphal entry, but it might be better to call it the triumphal approach, because everything is going really exciting, but then trouble starts when he actually enters Jerusalem. So, you know, triumphal entry is stuck forever, but, but it's really more of a triumphal approach. And recognizing this distinction, though, helps us to understand a little bit about what happens in the Gospel of Luke. So, in, Gos in Luke's account, after his triumphal entry, after cleansing the temple, Jesus stops, looks at the city, and begins to weep over it. And he says, Jerusalem, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. And then it goes on to prophesy the destruction of Jerusalem. But why does he do that? Why does he stop and speak words of judgment over Jerusalem? even while the crowd is hailing him as king. Because the city is not hailing him as king. The people outside it are. So there's, there's two receptions of Jesus going on in this passage. Some of the people don't recognize the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But back to the crowd outside the city. As Jesus is riding in, what are they saying? They, they proclaim, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And they're pulling these words from Psalm 118. The end of it, verses 25 through, through the end, they're pulling these words. 
And this is the last section of a group of psalms that the Jewish pilgrims would sing or chant as they approached Jerusalem for Passover. And these psalms were associated with hope that God would deliver his people, right? That this one who comes in the name of the Lord would be the deliverer, would be the one who would rescue and reign. So they were perfectly fitting for the occasion. And as they cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna is just a uh, English attempt at a Greek word, which is just an attempt to represent some Hebrew words. So we just say Hosanna because it sounds kind of like the words behind it. Coming from a phrase in, in Psalm 118, verse 25, where it's Hosanna. You could literally translate that as something like, save us now. Right? And that's how it's translated when we translate the psalm in 118. But it had become a, a sort of set idiom, a, a set expression of praise. And as they're, they're crying out, Hosanna, as Jesus comes, it would be something like saying, praise God. Right? Praise God because the son of David is here. Praise God because God is acting. So they're crying out in praise to God on account of Jesus coming. They're excited because the presence of a king must mean a kingdom. Jesus, the king like David, is coming to rule in Jerusalem just like David did. And that's pretty cool. So they're excited. Praise God. So we've got these two different groups in this story. The one group is excited. Praise God for Jesus. He's coming. The other group says, Jesus, leave. We don't want you here. You're causing problems. Our lives and the world that we're living in, let me back that up. There's something right in both of these groups, and there's something wrong in both of these groups in the way they're responding to Jesus. The crowd is excited for Jesus' coming. Here comes the king, and that's right, because Jesus is the king, and yet so much more and so much different than what the crowd was hoping for. They were welcoming a king, but he wasn't the king who was coming to liberate them right then. He wasn't the king who was coming to set up a new Israel as a new country. He was the king who was coming as the king of the world, but he was coming to die. He was coming to bring a hope that was greater than people were daring to hope but a very different hope than what people had. As Zechariah promised, he was the king who was coming, the humble king who would bring peace, who would shut off war. And yet that looks a lot different when the price of that is the king comes to die. But as we, as we think in, in terms of our lives, and our lives and our world are aching for a king who is able to serve others with love and care, rather than a king who follows his own plans for self-aggrandizement self at the expense of others. Our lives and world are aching for a king who is powerful to put down rebellion and put down wickedness and who can guard all peace. Our lives and world are aching for Jesus. The stronger king who we don't have to fear will use his strength to crush and destroy because he uses his strength to heal, to build up. And yet, at the same time, we see in the Jerusalem crowd something to take stock in. It's right to receive Jesus with hope and with joy. We also see something to, to take stock in, in in this crowd. In Jerusalem, they reject Jesus. They don't want him there. In the most immediate sense, there's two obvious reasons why they don't want him there. First, 
they've had enough of Jesus. They've already figured out we don't agree with you and we don't like your ideas and we don't like what you're saying, so leave. And the second, though, Jesus coming in was a problem because he's creating a great political instability that could result in the Romans coming and crushing and putting down a rebellion. But what the Jerusalem crowd wisely recognizes is that that Jesus coming as king upsets the status quo. Things cannot go on like they are when a new king enters the city. And of course, that's what stands behind the plot to get Jesus killed, the fight to keep things the way they are. We've got those two groups, these these two different ways of receiving Jesus. And the story continues on. But all all this, the hoopla around Jesus' coming is, is significant. And it forces us again to ask the question, what kind of king is Jesus coming to be? So we recognize he's putting himself forward as king, and now we think, and look at the story, what kind of king is Jesus putting himself forward as? So every election cycle in our, in our country, every four years, the political commentators who know things come on and say, you know, the new president has 100 days. Right? There they get their 100 days in which they're most likely to get their distinctive legislation passed, in which the Congress is least likely to try to stop everything that's going on about them. And then after that point in time, partisan politics descends again, and the normal business of running the country takes up all the time and effort, and the distinctive political vision of the president tends to fall by the wayside under the normal pressures of office. So if you want to understand what a president hopes to be or wants to be, you look back at the beginning, at what they do right away, how they act right away. And that's what we do with Jesus. He comes, presents himself as king, and so we look and say, what kind of king is Jesus intending to be? What are the priorities of Jesus' kingship? And for anyone who has paid attention to his ministry in the Gospels, nothing about what he does when he enters Jerusalem should be that surprising. He has taught repeatedly about the kingdom of God, and his actions and priorities continue that on as he enters into Jerusalem. And those actions are kind of troubling as we look at them and think about them because they show us that Jesus isn't the kind of king that people want him to be. So his first action is to go to the temple. From the direction that Jesus approaches, Jerusalem, the temple area is the first place you get to, but it also makes sense as the place to go to. It's the symbolic center of the Jewish nation, and it's also the religious center of the nation. It's the important place. And here, Jesus makes his first statement about who he is and what he he values by entering the temple courts and driving out all who were buying and selling there, overturning the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he says to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And Jesus, clearing house in what would have been a packed temple courtyard, is a striking action. So, from a a few historical notes to help better picture what's going on, there were three areas in the temple that people could get to. The outside court was called the Court of the Gentiles, and that's where non-Jewish people could go, as well as Jewish women. Then there was the Court of Jewish Men, and then there was the Court of the Priests, And then the most sacred of all is the Holy of Holies, in which only the high priest could go in once a year. 
So depending on who you were determined where you could get to. Well, this buying and selling was happening in the court of the Gentiles. So they've packed it out with really useful services, actually. Okay. Very practical services. If you're traveling from Greece or from Syria or even from Galilee, any more than a few miles out, you did not bring your own sacrificial animal with you. You brought money with you and you bought an animal to sacrifice when you got to Jerusalem. So it's really convenient. You go to the temple, buy a sacrificial animal right there. Um, also, the money changers would take the bizarre array of currency in use and change it to the currency that they used in the temple to pay the temple tax. So it's, it's actually a very useful service for travelers that they're providing. But Jesus' point is that it doesn't belong in the temple. The temple is not there to provide a useful economic service for people traveling. The temple is there to meet with God. So it doesn't belong. So he clears them out. And then he acts again. Not only does he clear out the temple, but then we're told in this unique story of Jesus that the unique story of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, um, that after he cleans out the courtyard, blind and lame people come into the temple and he heals them. He continues on his normal healing ministry, which, is, which he's been doing all over the country for his, his whole three years of ministry. Just showing again, Jesus' kingship is marked by a concern for others and by an act to mend that which is broken. And after witnessing these miracles, the children of the city run around and, and take up the cry, Hosanna to the son of David. And of course, David was that king who ruled in Jerusalem. His life and reign were the golden era. And so again, it's here, right? Here's the king, everything's gonna be all right. But what he, what he does in this healing is Jesus shows himself to be the sort of shepherd that the sheep actually need. Because there are hurt and broken sheep, and Jesus can heal them. And he has the power to clean out and to judge things that were wrong and things that were not being done in faithful service of God. He can protect the sheep from abuse that's happening to them, and he can heal them. And that all sounds great. And it is. But it also comes with a, a troubling undertone. And it's at this point of, of trouble that the text reaches out from just being an interesting history lesson about something that happened about 2,000 years ago to something that still is the question we have to answer today. Because Jesus went to Jerusalem, but he was not crowned king. Cleans out the temple and, and then leaves. The jubilant expectations of the crowd were not met. At the same time, people kept talking about Jesus, so the, the angry hopes of the Jerusalem crowd that didn't want Jesus there wasn't met either. And the children, who were rightly singing God's praise, left and went and played somewhere else. Everyone engaged Jesus, but what really changed? One thing did change, is everyone got a clearer answer of who is this King Jesus and what sort of kingdom he claims. He wasn't the king who was going to walk into Jerusalem and set up this new kingdom and fight against the Romans. He was also not the king who would tolerate apparent faithfulness. That was not actual faithfulness to God. And in coming that day into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, Jesus forced his contemporaries to reckon with who he really was, what sort of king he was going to be. And it turns out that a lot of people weren't really that sure they liked 
the idea of Jesus being king anymore after they see him in action. For many in the crowds and in power that day, the clear answer was, no, we do not want you to be our king. And so we see the religious leaders and the, the rulers in Jerusalem putting in this, in this plan of action to get Jesus killed. We see Judas, one of his closest followers, say, I'm out. I'm done with this. We can presume that many in the crowd who were out there shouting, Hosanna, had their fun. They got to shake their fist at the Roman powers, and then they went home. What we can see in Jesus' dramatic entry into Jerusalem is, is that, just like what he had already been teaching and what had already been doing, his kingdom was utterly different than what so many people wanted from him. And in light of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, which we celebrate next week, that same question lies before us. What kind of king is Jesus, and do we want him as our king? Because the reality that is that, that what Jesus says, what he calls for, the sort of king he says he is, is hard. And it doesn't meet a lot of our assumptions about how life ought to be for us. And don't get me wrong. The idea of a king who brings peace to a warring world, who heals the broken, who gives justice, who treats people with dignity and care, those are all really great ideas. They're very attractive ideas. Who doesn't want that? But the cost of having such a king, that, that cost is actually immense. Think about it. We know in our heart of hearts that the reason there is war in this world is because human desires, our desires, are never satiated. We want more. We want more comfort, more power, more influence, more convenience. The human heart never feels like it has enough, and so we fight and take and steal. We know the reason justice doesn't prevail in the world is that living justly is really hard. And it's a lot easier to not bother. We know the reason people are not treated with dignity is because we don't treat them with dignity. It's a lot easier to treat people we like with dignity and to not bother with the rest. We know that at least part of the reason there are so many physical hurts in the world that are not healed is because a lot of people with money, which includes most of us when we look at the world, would rather buy 10 more shirts or a new computer or a new TV or a new car than give a little bit more money to help someone get a surgery or to help someone get nutrition they need or whatever it be. We know that at least part of the reason there's such growing apathy and hostility towards the church and our culture is because too often we've been guilty more of excluding, judging, and condemning than with helping, healing, and loving. And, and the list could go on and on. In the triumphal entry, Jesus throws down a gauntlet. He says, here I am. I am the coming king. And here's the sort of king I promised to be. He offers himself as the king of a different kind of kingdom. And says, do you want me? Do you want this kingdom? Jesus is resisted then and now because his presence holds up a mirror that shows so clearly what is ugly in the human heart. If the price to pay 
for cheap computers is that workers in other parts of the world have to do things we would never dream of doing. If the price for having a little fun is that we speak of other people as though they are less than human and are not worthy of dignity. If the price for feeling good is that we destroy our bodies or destroy other people's bodies. If the price for feeling holy is that we make exceptions about what God cares for. If that is the price, are we willing to pay that price? And I think whether in these areas or others, far too often the answer we have to give is yes. We are in fact willing to pay that price to get what we want. And therein lies the heart of the question that Jesus forces us to ask. When King Jesus is present and ruling, he says no to so many things that we want to say yes to. The vision for life which he holds out is beautiful, and his teaching is beautiful, but the reality is it costs a lot. It requires a lot of giving up what we would otherwise choose to pursue in order to follow a king who wants a different sort of kingdom. And on this Palm Sunday, we remember Jesus came as a king. He showed us what God's kingdom looks like. He taught about it. He lived it. He entered Jerusalem as a king, and he was killed for doing that. That's the answer that humanity and we far too often give when confronted by the kingdom that Jesus wants to rule. Now, eventually, all people will come to a place where they either accept or reject King Jesus. But Jesus will not be co-opted for our causes, even if our causes are good. He will be king over his people, in his kingdom, in his way. And as we consider the question of whether we want Jesus to be our king, we need to do so looking forward to Good Friday, looking forward to Easter, looking forward and remembering Jesus didn't die in Jerusalem because he made a political misstep and ended up dead. But he came for the purpose of dying. Because the cost of having life, the cost of freedom from those broken desires in our hearts is that Jesus had to die. In order to free our hearts so that we could follow after him and say, yes, Jesus, I want you to be my king. So we look forward to Easter because Easter is the hope that our hearts don't have to remain broken permanently. That we can do more than just manage the different ways we sin against ourselves and other people. That our hearts can truly become steeped in the love of God as we experience it through the death, resurrection, and life-giving life of Jesus. And as we look forward to Good Friday and then to Easter Sunday, I hope... And I pray that the question of whether we want Jesus to be our king will be answered, yes and amen. That's an answer which we can give in faith. And that's an answer that we work out in our lives. And if you want to hear further about the hope which Jesus gives you, as we, as we sing our next song, you come down here, I'll be sitting down up here in the front or catch me on your way out the door. I'd love to talk to you more about this hope that we have in Jesus, the king of a different kind of kingdom. Would you pray with me? King Jesus, you come to rule. You come to bind up the broken, to confront the wicked, to shepherd a people, to cast out the false. Lord, you are good, and we pray we hope and we long for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. God, grab our hearts with the 
beautiful vision of Jesus, our King, so that we follow him and live more and more, day by day, the life of his kingdom. In your name we pray. Hymn of response is number 233 in the hymn book. Uh, the words will be on the screen also. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Please stand. now to the time of our service to share requests with one another and I'm just going to make you know and make known a couple from um, Shirley. It's for ongoing proud prayers for the family of Carol Higgins who died recently in March and also um, other members of her family. Her husband had a biopsy for a lung tumor and will receive those results tomorrow. Their son has mouth and throat cancer that's not responding to treatment. And then their daughter is right mourning all of what's going on in their family. Just keep them in, in your prayers. Um, ongoing prayers for um, the infant girl, Quinlan Smith, who was getting better but has developed a infection that is further complicating her already majorly complicated medical situation. And then uh, for a, a friend and coworker who's struggling to just get control of high blood pressure, as well as for a friend, um, Sue Marciniak, with surgery tomorrow for cancer. Um, other, other requests that people have. and Brock family. All right. 
you pray with me? Lord, on this day where we, as followers of Jesus, rejoice, as we remember that Jesus is king, Lord, we also can look around us in this world and see that there's so much that is left to be fixed and restored in this kingdom that we live in. We hear of Lord, brokenness in bodies and the need for, Lord, for healing. And we pray for the different surgeries and different treatments that are going on in these, in these that we've listed as well as others that we don't know about. Lord, for skill as the physicians practice, for, Lord, your miraculous work that you so often do simply through the, the incredible ways that you have built our bodies to heal and to work. God, we also just recognize that there's so much broken in the way that they work. And we pray for hope in the now as well as hope forevermore. Lord, that there will be a day where, where broken bodies will not define us anymore. God, we pray for hurts that come in the loss of loved ones in many different forms. And God, we pray that you would prove to be a God of comfort through your spirit and through the presence of your people in lives. And God, as we, you know, Lord, just together now pray in the words our Savior taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the power and the glory forever. Amen. will all join me on hymn 68 we stand all hail the power of Jesus name
you please remain standing? A variety of announcements today, in addition to the normal events of the week, there will be a Good Friday service held at Zion Lutheran Church at 3 p.m. on Friday. It's also be available via a Zoom link that you can find on our website. There's going to be a special business meeting right after service, so stay put. As well, after that, there will be a potluck to celebrate the church's 140th anniversary, which is a pretty incredible milestone. So please stay around to celebrate with us. Keep people keep and, and keep the and keep the meeting short. <laughs> yep. No. Also, next week there will be an Easter sunrise service at Lakeview Cemetery, 7 a.m. Right. Um, and in case of rain, it will be here, same time, um, normal Sunday service as well. Um, and you can come early on Easter, 9 a.m. and share in a time of fellowship and food. Um, announcement here, if you're interested in child or infant dedication, contact me. There will be a, a service on Mother's Day. Um, this is the last day to order Easter lilies because Easter is next week. So they're back there on the, uh, the wall. And April Missions Project, again, sign up on the wall for providing various things to, for emergency bags for police officers to have in the event that they need to have a child with them in an emergency situation for the child to have different comfort items and things to work on. And also international missions with Ukraine support. You can look there for further details. Any? So instead, come in fellowship. Thank you. Okay, receive now this benediction once I find it in my text. All right, here we go. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God.